Hi, this is Ellie Fishman. Welcome to our latest vodcast. This will be on misdiagnosis and body CT, which is always a popular topic, pearls and pitfalls. We've mentioned this before, but errors are a problem. It's not just radiology, it's all of medicine. This is from the Institute of Medicine, which really has, uh, is trying to be as fair as possible. These are all physicians, experts, not trying to blame anyone, but look at their numbers. This is not for radiology specifically, but a conservative estimate found that 5% of U.S. adults who seek outpatient care each year experience a diagnostic error. Postmortem exam research spanning decades has shown that errors contribute to approximately 10% of patients' deaths. That's bad. Medical records reviews suggest that diagnostic errors account for 6 to 17% of hospital adverse events, and that diagnostic errors are the leading type of paid medical malpractice claims are almost twice as likely to have resulted in the patient's death compared to other claims and represent the highest proportion of total patient payments. Now, forgetting the legal aspects of things, could you imagine 10% of patient deaths are related to medical error? The committee also, get this, concluded that most people who experience at least one diagnostic error in their lifetime, sometimes with devastating consequences, that means you'll die. Despite their pervasiveness of errors and their risk for serious patient harm, diagnostic errors have been largely unappreciated within the quality and patient safety movement in healthcare. Without a dedicated focus on improving diagnosis, these errors will likely worsen as the delivery of healthcare and the diagnostic process continues to increase in complexity. So not only are things bad, but Ballou, Miller, and Ball say things are only going to get worse. Now, they do target radiology a bit. They said perceptual cognitive errors made by radiologists are a source of error. In addition, incomplete or incorrect patient information, insufficient sharing of patient information may lead to the use of an inadequate imaging protocol, an incorrect interpretation of imaging results, or the selection of an inappropriate imaging test by the referring clinician. Referring clinicians often struggle with selecting the appropriate imaging test, in part because of the large number of available imaging options and gaps in the teaching of radiology in medical schools. Could not have said it better myself, and all of us do the same thing. You don't know why you did the study. The protocol, which can be optimized, is just done, scanned top to bottom. You don't make the diagnosis. You miss the diagnosis. Again, we need to know why we're doing a study. We need to make sure we do the right study for the right patient and interpret it correctly. Nothing that our patients don't expect us to do and nothing that seems like, oh my God, this is brilliant. This is Radiology 101. Looking at the data, Mike McCarry, who's a surgeon at Hopkins, made the point that medical error is now the third leading cause of death and maybe it's even first or second because cancer and heart disease are decreasing in numbers, but medical error, we don't even know the right number. That's based on some of the numbers that are published, but we're not even counting medical error is not even recorded on U.S. death certificates. And so from a radiology perspective, let's say you missed an obvious lung cancer or which could have been an obvious lung cancer two years ago, patient presents now with liver meds and then dies, well, it's lung cancer with metastatic disease. People aren't saying it's a misdiagnosis. Well, the truth is if you would have picked up the lesion earlier, you could have resected it, and perhaps the patient would have survived. So medical error is a problem. Now, the thing is we know that we're never going to be perfect. No matter how good we are, we're not perfect, and medical and human error is inevitable. But the point is we need to figure out ways of making errors less frequent, by following principles that take human limitations into account. Okay, really, really simple. We're never gonna be perfect, but how do we minimize error? And when you look at radiology, depending on what you read, errors occur three to 4% on normal studies, but up to 30% on positive studies. And either things are missed or they're misdiagnosed. About 42% were missed, simply missed. And I'm always worried about the things that are missed because if you look at a liver mass and you give the wrong differential and there's really F and H and you say hepatoma or it's hepatoma and you say F and H, someone else is probably going to look at that abnormal study. But if you say the study's normal, people are just going to close that study and never look at it again. Andy Rosencrantz, looking at uh, addendums to reports, found that at the end of the day, most addendums 
greater than 81, 84% were simply new findings, which simply meant that the first radiologist who read the finding totally missed it. Now, are we getting better? Well, the faster we go, the more errors we make. This article by Sokolovakaya made the point that if you increase the speed of reading, the, in, the radiologist, by a factor of almost three, increase their error rate. Okay, no surprise. Our study found a significant correlation between faster reading speed and the number of major misses and interpretation errors. Well, Waits says maybe you should double read. Well, I'll tell you, these days we're lucky we single read. We ain't double reading anything. And you could say you're reading with residents or fellows, but that's not double reading in most cases, unless you have a great fellow and res or resident. What can we do? Well, Johnny Ivey says we need to make things simple. The key and the beauty is not making a complex problem more complicated, it's making a complex problem simple, and that's what we need to do. Now, it's not just CT. I don't want to pick on CT. It's MR, it's ultrasound, it's plain film, it's everything. In this article, uh, Herzog looked at MRI in a patient with back pain. They had two experts read the study, and then because it's MR, you can get the study done over and over. And so the study was done at 10 different centers in a small area. And guess what? The reports were totally different. Across 10 study exams, there were 49 distinct findings reported related to the presence of a distinct pathology. Zero interpretive findings were reported in all 10 studies, and only one finding was reported in 9 of 10. Of the interpretive findings, 32% appeared only once across all of the 10 reports. And the variability was so extensive, and the management recommendations were from surgery to doing nothing. And that's on an L-spine study. That's not doing something super complicated, super rare. It was basics, and yet there was no consensus. And yes, we do look at images. We try to think and optimize, but it's human perception, and some degree of error is inevitable even with experienced observers. But again, less experienced people are going to have more problems. And how do you develop tools to mitigate against error? Well. This idea about reinterpretation, of course, is always a good one. Um, and we know that when you bring in outside studies, we know that the outside studies suck. We know that every study on the outside sucks. We don't know who these outside hospitals are, but if we find out, boy, those guys are in trouble. And every place says the outside people are no good. So in this article by Itchery, 41% error rate for head and neck tumors. In this article by Busby, um, talks about the variation, and of course, this results in lawsuits. Uh, people talk about the different types of error, interpretive error, perceptual error, um, the fact that second and third abnormalities decrease because of satisfaction of search. There's a lot written about errors, and here's a chart of all the things, the cognitive biases, all the things you can do wrong from attribution bias, satisfaction of search, premature closure, hindsight bias, confirmation bias. There's so many biases, I can't even remember what the biases are. And there's so many potential ways of making error, I'm shocked anyone ever reads a study correctly. Well, I try not to read these articles about describing how you make errors. I tend to read the articles on what the errors are and how I can avoid them. So what we did at Hopkins a number of years ago, Karen Horton and Pam Johnson wrote an article looking at what the common errors were. Because you know, at the end of the day, you can make a million errors on a CT or an MR or an ultrasound, but it seems the same errors are made over and over again. And what if we just avoided making those common errors? We should be like superstars. We should do a lot better. And we looked for each error, trying to figure out how to avoid that error. And the fact is, you know, Brooke Jeffrey has made the point that if you know the errors, you think about them, that's what you look for. You're not going to make the same errors twice. Now, there's so many ways you can make errors, big global things, poor search strategy, you're looking at abdominal CT, not thinking about the PE, 
poor understanding of pathology? Is that stomach distended or understended? I speak about protocols. That's one of the biggest things. Maybe it's not you, but if you're not giving oral contours in the ER, every stomach is under distended or every stomach looks like a mass or you don't know what's going on. We also make assumptions. You're scanning for dissection. You're scanning for trauma. There's a renal lesion. Looks well defined. You don't measure it as fast or as much as you should. And instead of that renal cyst, you're talking about a papillary renal cell carcinoma. We also know that unsuspected pathology, when someone says rule out the section, you're probably not going to miss the section, but you might miss a PE, you might miss a renal cancer. We know that incidental findings are found everywhere, and the better the scanners get, the better the protocols, the more incidental findings you can come up with. And I also thought another source of pathology, and I put this down about five years ago, is when you check residents or fellows. Not that we don't have good residents or fellows, but the problem is in the wording. You're checking, which means you're not sitting correctly. You're looking. They did the search. If I look at timing, you're probably reading three to five times faster than if you were dictating yourself. You don't study the case quite as carefully. You don't look at the records quite as carefully. That fellow or resident is telling you stuff, and you're listening. Well, I noticed that a lot of times I see errors when there's two readers, which means they're faculty and a fellow, a faculty and a resident, and very few when it's a faculty alone. So that's something to be aware of because maybe you let your guard down. Maybe it's easier to check, and it surely is, but you got to be careful when you're checking. You should not be checking studies. You should be reading studies. Now, what else can we make mistakes on? A few of these are technical in nature. Cardiac, CT, and spine are the ones this refers to. Cardiac, CT, rule out coronary artery disease. Targeted images are done to get the best spatial resolution. And you can see very nicely here the plaque in the LED. You can see plaque in the right coronary in this patient with the right dominant circulation. But we target the images because it gives us the best spatial resolution. But I think one of the things we know is you need to reconstruct full field of view. We reconstruct full field of view within sections, and we put a special report on that. We don't get paid extra, but we put a report there because we want to make sure we looked at it. And in this patient, there's a lung cancer. That was the cause of the patient's symptoms. Obvious cancer, right lower lung. Targeted images, you would have missed it. What a catastrophe. And here you're able to pick it up. The same thing is true with full field of view for lumbar spines. Back pain is a million reasons for back pain from dissection to tumors and the like. You're looking for disc disease, so you target down. But you should reconstruct, even if it's 5 millimeter thick sections every 5 millimeters, to get the full field of view. Sometimes it doesn't happen because the neuro guys might be reading the spines and the body guys got to read the abdomen, but then there's no code and there's no way to charge. And this article by Lee found that 40% of adult outpatients undergoing lumbar spine CT examinations for back pain um, had findings that were present. Most of the findings, two-thirds of them, were benign and of no further evaluation necessary. But a third were of interest. And the full field of view was necessary in almost 80% of cases to visualize the lesion. And in their series, they found tumors, renal cells, and TCCs, and CLL, and sarcoid, and AAA. 4.3% of the studies. That's not inconsequential. And the reason the patient had back pain probably related to these findings. So you really need to look at the full field of view. How many of you, by a show of hands, are actually looking at full field of view in spine images? Hmm, I could see out of the thousands of people I could see, I'm seeing like Woodstock, 400,000 people, three people are raising their hand. You got to look at the full field of view. You got to figure out how to do that. Another technique, do you look at the topogram? Well, people sometimes say, well, there's a question, I look at the topogram. I'm saying, do you look at the topogram every case? So in this patient with retained barium in the colon with a fever, you realize there wasn't retained barium, but that was the ring of a sponge. And in this post-op patient, there's bowel obstruction because of a retained sponge. Look how easy it is to see that on the scalp, but so hard to see on the axials. And there's an article by Leonard Berlin about this. Dr. Berlin called me up a number of years ago and said, do you look at the topogram? I kind of hedged and said, no. He goes, is anyone? I said, I don't know. And I checked, and one person started raising their hand, and I told them to put their hand down because they were lying. Nobody looked at the topogram all the time. And so we looked. Bob Gaylor, Bill Scott, 
looked at over 2,000 scout views to look at what they can find treating the scout view as a plane film. And they found in 20 plus percent of cases findings, but most of these findings were explained by the CT scan. But 2% of the time they found important findings. Well, you can argue it's only 2%, but does that mean you should look? But 2% could be anywhere from lung cancer to tumors. Remember, the topogram extends beyond the area you might scan. You can see things in the lung you don't see in abdominal CT. And 2% of the time we found something. And Dr. Berlin said, okay, there are no guidelines. And it's only 2%, but 2% against 85 million is 1.7 million patients. And he felt that you need to look at the topogram. If you read his article, there was a case in Chicago uh, that went from multi-million dollars in legal costs. And it was simply that a kid had fell, fallen. They did not see a bleed. And in retrospect, even a bleed by top neuroradiologists could not be seen. But on the scalp view, you can see an obvious skull fracture, which is impossible to see on the axial images. And when they asked the doctor, the radiologist, why he didn't look at the topogram, he said, we don't look at topograms. Well, a few million dollars later, he's probably now looking at topograms. And Dafta made the point that scalp views are really the edge of the film. You need to look at them. And Itri made the point that we need to figure out a way is to simply review the scout images and include a field in your templates that says scout view. You need to look at it, whether it's the fact that when you open a case, the scout view comes up at first. That would be fine. Remember, in the old days, we had topograms. And so with topograms, I mean, we had them printed on film. And so you always saw them. When you have things printed on film, you always looked at them. So that became very, very important. The last thing to comment on is consultations. Articles have shown second reads are more accurate. And in this case, 37%. And you can see it was for every cancer, very high numbers. I wondered were these referring tertiary specialists so good or the initial radiologists so bad? Well, you could see they actually never ever looked at what the report said. They simply asked what the referring physician thought which meant they may not have looked at the films or they misinterpreted or whatever. And they said it really doesn't matter what the radiologist said initially because the oncologist managed the patients. It's what the oncologist says. So now you have a situation where no one's reading your report and they're looking at the images and making their own decisions. And those decisions, not surprisingly, are often incorrect. So you have to realize how we give information, how people use information becomes very, very critical. We talk about errors of communication, of documentation, all sorts of failures. But we're responsible to make sure we try to minimize those failures. We need to make things simple and clear and easy. And we need to make sure the information we find, particularly critical information, ends up in people's hands. And you wonder what percent of your reports you never read. If, if you have residents, is it sent to the resident or the fellow who's no longer on service? Is it sent to the right Dr. Cameron or the wrong Dr. Cameron? What exactly is going on? And these are all things that are problems and things we need to address and you need to address in your own practice. So with that, those are some generic things. Let's take a few minute break and come back and let's look at specific clinical examples, starting with bladder cancer. I'll be right back and see you in a minute. Bye. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctsus.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.